Hi, podcast listeners. My name is Madison Hopkins, and this is Modern Ways. Modern Ways is a guide to eco-friendly homes. And on this podcast, I combine sustainability and real estate for people who want to change their home environment. In each episode, my guests and I empower you with fundamental knowledge so you can create your eco-friendly home and thus change the world around you. Thanks for tuning in today. I really appreciate you being here and hope you learned something new. So let's hop on in to the modern ways of eco-friendly homes. On today's episode, we have Colin McIntosh. <laughs> For those of you watching on YouTube or in any sort of clips that I put out, you might already have noticed he is in bed. <laughs> For those of you listening on the podcast, in case you didn't already know, Colin is currently sitting in his bed. So Colin is the founder and CEO of Sheets and Giggles, one of the fastest growing brands in the $12 billion U.S. betting industry. Launched in May 2018 with nearly 300000 in crowdfunding campaign, s and became one of the few companies to make $1 million in sales in its first 12 months. s and has since won first place at Denver Startup Week 2018, grown four times year over year, and raised over $2 million in investment money. s and places emphasis on doing good and having fun, especially with sustainably made products and socially responsible business practices. The company's eucalyptus lyocell bedding uses up to 96% less water to make than cotton, uses no insecticides or pesticides. The company also mm -hmm. plants one tree for every order, planting nearly 20,000 trees in the U.S. from 2019 sales alone, and regularly donates to causes like the World Wildlife Foundation and COVID-19 Emergency Release Relief. s and was even recently recognized by Amazon as one of six small businesses to making, making an impact during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Colin, I... That was your intro. You're an amazing human. You have started an amazing company. Um, I appreciate the intro. It was really, really warm. And I, I need to make sure that we trim that down because I feel like it was like my whole life story and like a two paragraph thing. Well, you are, you've had a really crazy life story and I'm actually really happy that the intro gave so many like numbers and statistics because that's mostly what you get interviewed for is your amazing like business model your business growth but you're here on my podcast today because you have a sustainable betting company and i think that's really cool and the business practices you're of course welcome to talk about that as much as you want but my questions are totally uh centered around the the eucalyptus being used for betting yeah i love that and it's i get interviewed a lot on like you know, I've been on like Shopify's podcast and, you know, I, I got interviewed by Amazon recently and they all, everybody always wants to ask about like, you know, starting a business and all the, the marketing stuff. And so it's going to be fun. I, I don't do a lot of sustainability interviews specifically, so I'm really excited. Yeah. And I've listened to your stuff and you have said it's, it's not your leading value proposition, the sustainability mm. aspect. So you want to tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so it's just something that I I actually kind of intuitively thought when I was starting the company, and this is just just my perspective. I think that you can have the most sustainable product in the world, and if it's not better than the unsustainable version, then people just won't buy it. And I think that that's just generally the American consumer and and our preferences. And I speak as an American consumer that uh, makes sometimes selfish decision, decisions, and so when we were starting, I really, you know, resisted the urge to lead with buy these sheets because you're a good person. And instead, the core value prop is they're literally softer than cotton. They're more breathable. They're more moisture wicking. If you're a hot sleeper, they're going to be a godsend at night. You know, they, they're just absolutely beautiful. We love our colors. It looks fantastic on every bed. And so it was really just kind of comparing it to cotton and then kind of closing out the sale with, and of course, they're sustainable. They use up to a thousand gallons less of water to make a set versus cotton sheets. They don't use any petroleum, more like a, like a polyester based synthetic wood. And we think that that's just more of like a really strong closing value proposition instead of the leading value proposition, especially in this industry. Because, you know, for example, you can make bed sheets out of hemp, but they're fairly rough. And I just generally don't think that you can create a sustainable bedding company if you have a subpar product. And so we always lead with the fact that it's better than cotton, 
and then close with that it's sustainable. And I think that's been really successful for us. And I, I would actually really like to see more sustainable products do the same thing because I think that in 2020 being sustainable is I think less of a meaningful differentiator than it used to be. And I think that now to go for the throat of unsustainable products, you really have to go after their core value proposition, which has always been better and cheaper. And I think that's the next wave of sustainable products. I definitely agree. I like that you lead with it's better than cotton and that you have other elements about it. Like I agree. I would never sleep on hemp Um, (laughs) because I've worn like hemp pants and like, not it's yeah it's not, yeah it's not, not for sleeping and then cotton i actually have like organic cotton sheets right now mm-hmm. which i'm really thankful to have because there are some i, I stayed at an airbnb i was like these are the softest sheets ever and i asked them what they were where they got them they're like they're just microfiber from walmart and i was oh, like no i know, I know, no. I know. <laughs> yeah it, the synthetic stuff is always people always tell me they're like they're like, oh, I just love like how microfiber feels. And then I actually asked them, like, you know what microfiber is? And a lot of people don't even know that microfiber is polyester. They've actually, it's actually a fantastic branding job calling it microfiber because I think that it's really conflated what the material actually is in people's minds. And so I, I always try to let people know when you see microfiber, it generally means uh, polyester. And so it's just been such a good job by that industry to brand that. And I think something, uh, the last statistic I saw maybe, maybe a few months ago on the numbers in home textiles was that approximately two thirds of all home textiles sold are made from polyester. Um, I know, yeah, it's, it's, it's massive. And so it's just a, a huge amount of plastic being consumed constantly. And so it's frustrating though, because it is soft. I mean, it's synthetically made to be soft as hell, but it's uh, yeah, it's not great for the planet. Yeah. One besides the water aspect, which I would like to touch on eventually, but I know whenever you wash clothes or mm-hmm. sheets that are made from microfiber polyester, like a yep. synthetic material, it creates a lot of like micro particles that go into mm-hmm. the ocean. So how do your sheets, and I've, I've listened to podcasts on that. I don't know all the numbers and stuff, but there's huge, like re- for anyone listening who wants to know, there's huge reusable fashion podcasts out there you can totally listen to. But Colin, how, do the, how does the eucalyptus compare to that? So is it biodegradable? Oh yeah, so it's 100% biodegradable. So in fact, our uh, eucalyptus lyle cell will actually biodegrade about 40% faster than cotton. And so if you were to put our sheets in a landfill, or God forbid, you know, the ocean, they'd be gone in about nine weeks and without a trace. So there's no, there's no microplastics or plastic or any, any petroleum-based product in our fabric that would break down into a microplastic. So they're safe to wash at home. There's no groundwater contamination. And it's, you know, one of the things I think a lot of people don't even realize about polyester is that poly clothing and bed sheets are actually the number one source of microplastics in the ocean. And then, you know, we, we end up eating, eating and drinking microplastics. And the uh, long-term effects of that, I'm assuming, are not going to be great for our overall public health. But you know, there's a lot of studies in terms of uh, trying to figure out what the long-term effects of that sort of material in our drinking water will do. But yeah, I'm very proud that our sheets biodegrade nine weeks and no trace left behind. Yeah, you should definitely be proud of that fact. That's really awesome. Yeah. Okay, two questions. What is eucalyptus and what is a lyocell? <laughs> so eucalyptus is, uh, two great questions. So Eucalyptus is obviously a plant um, tree, and there are over 700 species of eucalyptus in the world, much of which is grown in Australia, just naturally. It's where the the habitats are. Most people are probably familiar with the Australia wildfires and brush fires and urbanization that is currently decimating the koala habitat. And we actually care really deeply about that. We don't harvest any trees from Australia, nor do we harvest any endangered trees or endangered species. We harvest our trees from biodiverse farms that are managed in coordination with an NGO that specifically prevents and protects natural environments from being harmed by the forest industry. And so that being said, we did donate and do give back to uh, Australia. We donated 20% of all of our sales from Black Friday weekend in 2019 to the World Wildlife Foundation, specifically to their Koala Conservation Fund. 
And that was, I think, close to $20,000 donated just from that weekend of sales, which was really awesome. And so what ends up happening is they harvest the trees. And for, for listeners who are familiar with uh, bamboo fabric, that's actually called bamboo viscose. Uh, and bamboo viscose is very similar to eucalyptus lyocell in the sense that they are both forms of what's called cellulosic rayon. So cellulosic plants, cellulose rayon fabric, so fabric made from plants. And they're both classified by uh, the government as man-made materials because bamboo doesn't grow in the ground as a fiber like cotton, nor does a eucalyptus tree. And so you, in both processes, you take the wood uh, from the tree, you put it into a batch of solvents, you break it down to a pulp, that pulp then dries, becomes a fluffy fiber, uh, very similar to a cotton. It's actually even softer. It has literally a lower coefficient of friction. And then that fiber will then be turned into yarn and that yarn into our fabric. And so it's a really fantastic process. The difference between bamboo viscose and eucalyptus lyocell cell is that bamboo is the first generation of this process. Eucalyptus lyocell cell is the third generation of the process and latest generation of the process. And the major benefit between viscose versus lyocell cell is that you can reuse about 99.5% of the chemicals in every batch of lyocell cell production. So whereas viscose, when you do bamboo in and pulp out, you generally have to dump the chemicals and do a new batch of chemicals for the next batch of wood pulp production. And unfortunately, when you're talking about you know, certain manufacturers, not all manufacturers, but some, that means a lot of wastewater and a lot of uh, chemicals being dumped directly into waterways. And so what I love about Lyle cell is that it's a totally closed loop system whereby you're constantly reusing the chemicals in every single batch of production. So it's just wood in, pulp out, wood in, pulp out. And it's a, it's a really fantastic method of fabric production that's widely considered to be the most sustainable method of fabric production in the world. That's really incredible, actually. So for those people listening, I just want to clarify what a closed loop system is and Colin help me help me do this because yeah, I don't sure. know, I look it up but um a closed loop is generally like when I mean you said it but when things are used and then reused and exactly, it goes yeah. back into the same process bingo it's it's when there is effectively zero waste and and you know we're signed up with our manufacturing partners signed up with an organization uh, it's called zero discharge of hazardous chemicals to make sure there's no uh, wastewater runoff and our production. All the wastewater from our process is filtered through our factory through a, a multi-layered reverse osmosis system. It's really, really quite fantastic. And you can see, I think there's a picture on our website, on our blog that I took myself actually at the factory where you have wastewater in one jar and it's black. And then in the next jar over is a perfectly clear glass of water that you could drink that has gone through that filtration system that is then pumped back in and reused throughout the process, which is one of the ways that we use such little water uh, is because pretty much every drop of water that comes off the line gets filtered and then reused throughout the production system. And so you're exactly right in describing a closed loop system. And we also do other things to uh, amplify that. So these eye masks, for example, they come in every box. They're super fun, cheats and giggles. Okay. And we get, a, we get a lot of fun pictures with people with, with these on. And so those actually are made from leftover fabric that would be thrown away. And that's what we call uh, upcycled. So basically, if there's fabric left on the floor that we weren't going to use, you know, we'll put it into our purple dye because that's our signature color. And then we'll go ahead and come out with uh, eye masks and our sheets come wrapped in knapsacks instead of plastic. We have zero plastic in our packaging. And so it's all part of that same sort of zero waste idea. So that's a great segue. I wanted to ask you about like, is your shipping sustainable your, and your packaging and also the manufacturing or the factory? Yeah. So in terms of our manufacturing partners, yeah, they're amazing. They're incredibly sustainable. They've got sustainable supply chains. You know, they've, they've won many different awards for, for what they've been doing at the factory over the last decade or so. And um, where are they located? Where's your manufacturer located? Our main manufacturer is located in India, and they're absolutely wonderful. Our Indian team, great group of people, Avinash and the whole crew over there. And I, you know, in terms of the factory itself, it's, I go there myself, love visiting and love being on the ground and, and uh, seeing our operation at work. 
We were actually going to open an Alabama factory in 2020, which was going to be the first. This material is not a, this eucalyptus lyocell. It's not a U.S. invented material. It's actually was invented in Europe. And so it's not, it's never been produced in the United States before. We were planning on being the first people to actually try to have a cut and sew operation for this in the U.S. Didn't work out because of the COVID-19 supply chain disruptions. But we're really excited for 2021. Hopefully we can make good on those plans. That being said, I mean, India is a wonderful place to produce fabric. And it's a highly technical, highly scientific process, this, this method of fabric production. And so there's not a ton of manual labor worked into it. It's, it's fairly automated. And then in terms of the shipping itself, I think that's a great question. I would actually answer quite honestly, no, uh, our shipping is not sustainable. And we are a young company. We're in year three of our operations right now. And we're looking into next year and year four, doing what a lot of companies are beginning to hop on the trend of, of offsetting our carbon footprint of our shipping by, you know, via, there's different things that you can purchase and different carbon tax that you, can, that you can pay in order to offset that footprint. And so we're looking into that now for 2021. And you already said you plant a tree for every set. Yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, in, in terms of offsetting our carbon footprint, that's one of the things that I wanted to do from day one, because I know that at the end of the day, you know, moving something from our warehouse in Fort Lauderdale to Atlanta or Los Angeles to Seattle, you know, is just going to be a process that has emissions at some point. There's going to be a carbon footprint in that operation you know, shipping internationally as well. And so we, right now, for every tree that we harvest, we plant two, two more on our, on our farms. And then for every order that we receive, we plant a tree somewhere, actually, usually in the United States, I think about 90% of the trees we've planted have been in the United States. Now I'm talking tens of thousands of trees at this point. And we plant that in coordination with a partner called One Tree Planted, really fantastic organization. I've done digs myself out in Four Mile Canyon in Boulder on Earth Day. And it's so great to, to get out there myself and see all the volunteers planting all the trees that we've made possible with our donations. And so we'll donate trees to Colorado, California, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest, Florida, some places in Canada. I think we actually planted another thousand in a mangrove project they were doing in Asia this year, which is really cool. And we officially joined their 1 million tree challenge because we planted 10,000 all at once which is a nice big donation for them and so yeah it's it's been really cool to be able to do that along the way and just build that I think about it as like building altruism into our variable cost model in the sense that we can't plant those trees if we don't make any sales and so it's a nice galvanizing thing for for our team to do knowing that we're doing good along the way as we as we uh, grow as a company nice thank you for doing that that's really cool one of my favorites probably my favorite thing we 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 do a lot of different pieces that like all kind of come together to create this like doing good as a function of succeeding, which is like what I really wanted to set it up as. We do a lot of homeless shelter donations, a lot of monetary donations, planting trees. We've, that we've pledged 1% of our equity uh, and 1% of our profits to local Colorado charities. So, you know, that functionally means that if we end up, you know, going public, 1% of those proceeds will go to Colorado charities. And so there's a, there's a lot of cool little things we've, we've baked into the model. I'm really glad that I got to meet you, like, just as a person first, because, <laughs> because I've listened to three of the podcasts you've been interviewed on so far, and it's usually based around your business model and, like, what you've done, because it's been really cool. Thanks. But I think from a listener's point of view, I just, I, I want to ask you if you could share about your, your previous company you were with that had the, the tracking watches, just so people can like get to know you. Cause you have such a, what did you call it? Maybe not a philanthropic heart, but you said, didn't you say like your mom calls it? A bleeding heart? Yeah. A bleeding heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I've had a weird, I've had a, I mean, I don't know how deep you want me to get into uh, my background, but. Just enough to like, you know. I mean, so uh, the, the, the earliest decision that I can remember making that was like such a bleeding heart decision, and I, I don't know, I don't know why, why I am the way that I, that I am. I think it's my dad and my grandma, but basically I remember I was 24 years old. I was living in Seattle. 
And uh, there was a company called Drizzly. For listeners that are familiar with Drizzly, it's a uh, Uber for alcohol. It's alcohol on demand. And it was like the coolest company at the time. They had just raised 5 million bucks. They were 30 people. They were, they were growing like a weed. And they made me an offer to be their Seattle lead. And I was 24 years old. And the, the value proposition was, you'll be the coolest guy in Seattle. You'll, you'll be you know, slinging booze all day. And you'll be the guy connecting all the liquor stores to, to partiers and da, da, da. And it was like a really hot startup. And I got this offer from them and I, and I was about to take it and I was considering it. And then I got an offer from this guy who was starting a, a pet startup for, for uh, pet shelters. And basically the, the goal was to end animal euthanasia and every shelter that we signed up, basically we would help them raise more money via licensing more animals with this technology in order to get them more funds to save more lives. <laughs> And I'll never forget the CEO of that company. He told me, he was like, look, man, he's like, I'll, I'll just put it on the table. He's like, you can sling booze or you can save lives. And he's like, and, and it's kind of, you know, up to you. And I was like, oh man, like, how are you going to put it in those terms? <laughs> and so, so I, it has a great recruiting pitch. And so I, I turned down uh, Drizzly, which I actually know, I know the guys at Drizzly. I know I've met them. I've met their team. I've met their CEO. Like they're funny. They're good guys. To this day, they make fun of me for, for you know, and they're, they're still a little salty because they thought that they had made a hire and then they had to go through the recruiting process again. So that was the first time I ever made like a really like, like kind of like decision that was probably not great for my career. And, but you know, it, it is what it is. And then I ended up going to another startup maybe about a year later that was called Revelar. It was interesting. It was a wearable tech startup like you were talking about, similar to Fitbit. But if you pressed it, it would send out an emergency alert and live location data to your friends and family, let them know where you were and that you needed help. The mission was to end sexual assault and violence. I actually wrote that business plan when I was 23 uh, with my friend Jackie, who was the CEO after her little sister had been uh, assaulted, unfortunately. Her little sister is now one of my best friends in the world. I went to her wedding uh, in November of last year. And... We, you know, that company really took off like a bright star. We, we raised millions of dollars. We, we hired 30 people in downtown Denver. We were in Target, Brookstone. We were on HSN, QVC. I was doing all of our retail deals. So I was flying to Minneapolis, Arkansas, Seattle, you know, New Hampshire, all over the country for these retail deals. And, um, Unfortunately, we, uh, there's a lot to learn from that, but we all got laid off at 1 p.m. on a Monday in September 2017. And I was so upset about that because I had poured so much of my, of my 20s and of my kind of emotion into that, that I think I lost my mind a little bit. And three weeks later, I started a pun-based betting company. And that was almost three years ago. So yeah, it's been a pretty, pretty weird career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for diving into that with us. And just because it's so unique to meet someone who is like very business driven and good at that, but also very like environmental, like people, like bleeding heart driven and also really good at that. So yeah, just thanks for diving into that with us. For sure. I think you gotta, you gotta do both, you know, like you can't help people if you're not successful. You know what I mean? This is true. Yeah. So I want to ask you, why did you choose the color purple and how? <laughs> so I was looking up, when I was starting the company, I was looking up sleep colors. And, and I didn't know this, but apparently purple and yellow are like the traditional sleep colors. So I don't like yellow. So I went purple. <laughs> and then there's another reason why as well. There is a mattress company called Purple. I respect them a lot. I am obsessed with their, their branding and they, they're a very funny brand voice, which I, I really wanted to emulate with the, the company in a lot of ways. They were an inspiration for me. And I, you know, kind of thought to myself, well, if we do purple everything and they're purple and like, you know, we're funny and they're funny and like we have sustainable sheets and like they, they kind of focus on sustainability sometimes. I was like, maybe uh, they'll give me a call one day and then bring us into the, into the fold. So there were a couple of strategic reasons behind it, but it, I think it's also to be completely like one more thing is like, 
everybody in this brand in this space in the in the betting industry is so boring it's always black it's always gray it's always the same you know white walls and white sheets and it, yeah it's boring as hell i mean you see we do we do our photo we do a lot of our photo shoots in my bedroom and you can see this painting i've got you know like our our pictures just like pop and and you know our colors pop and you know we don't do things i think in a normal sort of betting way i think that's what's been most successful for us is the way that we just stand out visually from the crowd yeah i actually just made I love these. the blue yeah i love it yeah so i've got like different colors that one's actually blue and it goes with my like podcast background which i absolutely love color color just like color tangent for a minute we could do a sustainability at all white white and gray are so boring you know and and i will but there are two best sellers white and gray sheets you know like so people people like their neutrals what else uh, have you have green we got mint green we have the purple which is identical to this purple we've got a love a beautiful light blue like a sky blue which is i think is just unbelievably gorgeous uh and then we have a navy which is like a midnight and then uh, uh the last one is a pearl which is like an off-white cream which is i think really lovely and then we're coming out with red tan uh lavender and a true sage green for folks next month i think end of august so yeah nice most of the rainbow yeah yeah you know we don't people always ask for a, like a fuchsia or a pink and i just we do survey we do, <laughs> he's like i won't do it you know, I feel I I, I want to give the people what they want, but we do surveys and it consistently comes back that it's like half a percentage point of people want pink. And I just can't, I can't justify the production expenditure. I just can't do it. And, and, the, and, and but I will say those people are very passionate about, I think people that like pink sheets are very passionate people. So the half a percentage point of the people who voted on the survey are the only ones that reach out to you for pink sheets. They are, I say the half of people that have a percent, half a percentage point of people that want pink are 50% of the people that email us with a color request. Yes. <laughs> they, they, they will constantly ask us for, for pink. Yeah. That's funny. So yeah, I noticed on the pictures that, and kind of right now to the pillow, your sheets look a lot like silk. Yeah. Yeah. They're nice and like, they're nice and shiny. This one's wrinkled because I've been sleeping on it, but like, yeah, they're, so they're, Generally speaking, they're, they, they have this sheen to them that is, uh, I think, for me, very attractive. I like it. I, I love that look on the bed when you walk in. It's just it's got this beautiful sheen. But then, you know, over time, it does, it becomes less, you know, less of a, that sheen. It still keeps some of it. Um, you can see, especially in the light. But yeah, it, it, it'll never look dull. I love it. That was like a perfect marketing ad right there. Just like rubbing the sheets from the it's inside. So soft. Like, I literally yeah. transfixed on it for yeah. a moment. It's so nice. Yeah. I, love, I, I swear to God, I get, I get in my bed every night and I wake up every morning and I just cannot believe that this is my company. And this is what I do. And I'm just like, and, and it's great because I do like the little, you know, like little bed angels. I like... <laughs> I like do that like you know like a little, yeah like a little snow angel in bed and like and it's just I don't know it makes me happy that this is my you know this is my thing this is my my company my nephew Roman he's three years old he he always tells he tells people he's like my uncle Colin uh made my my sheets and it gets some some weird looks but he, he always brings me to his room and he's like look look and he's like these are these are your sheets I'm like they are my sheets like it, I, I love that kid he's, but it's just it's just such a weird thing that I've I've gotten myself into to be completely honest. I heard on one of your podcasts and correct me cuz it was a couple of days ago. You are in the process of getting athletes to like give you their feedback on if they're actually sleeping better in your sheets. So we do we have some people that are that are sleeping on our sheets right now that are that are pro baseball players and that are you know pro surfers. We've got some folks that I think we got a couple NFL players and we haven't done anything formal in terms of, you know, kind of got, we, I, I don't know. This is probably really bad marketing to be completely honest, but like, I don't like the whole like influencer culture where, you know, you, you ask people for their constant endorsement and, you know, and to plug your product. And so I figure, and I see, I see it on their Instagrams, you know, like if, if, you know, there's a guy named, uh, Phil Evans, who plays for the Pittsburgh Pirates, who, you know, he sleeps on our sheets and 
he posts about them and, and, and we don't ask him to, and, and, you know, we don't, we don't do anything in exchange for that. And I just think that like people will post about uh, good stuff. And so we're going to be reaching out to them and asking them, you know, about changes in their sleep patterns, if they've seen them sleeping through the night more, because um, there's a lot of science behind sleep. And there's a company that I, I were, were like corporate friendly with called eight sleep that does a really cool mattress. So happy to plug them. And they, they have a lot of athletes that sleep on their, on their mattress and they do a lot of like the studies behind it. And I've learned a lot from, from chatting with them and from also like their studies where, you know, whether it's your, your first REM cycle of the night and how crucial that first three to four hour period is to, you know, waking up on a six, seven and a half or nine hour block. So that way you're waking up at kind of the tail end of a REM cycle. And I've, I've like changed the way that I set my alarm. I've changed the way that I, I think about, you know, times when I go to sleep and then at hours I want to get to sleep. So we'll probably come out with a little bit more of that marketing in the future, but we, we don't make it a focus right now. Cool. I also wanted to ask you, is it good for your skin? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, can't you tell? I, uh, but so, so, this is 30. Okay. But so, so no, so basically because it has a lower coefficient of friction, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it actually won't, it's way better for sensitive skin. It won't pull your hair. Uh, your hair won't get like tugged in it, like in the pillowcase, like a lot of other different, that's why people buy silk pillowcases. Is so there is no abrasion on the face or abrasion or, or pulling of the hair. And we get people all the time. There's a blog post that we wrote called good for what ails you, which I, one of my favorite things we've ever written. And it's really, we don't really write much. It's just a lot of the reviews from people that have fibromyalgia, eczema. We have reviews from people that have neuropathy, psoriasis, multiple sclerosis, and they will leave us reviews about how our sheets are the only ones that get them through the night because they don't irritate their skin. And so along with being hypoallergenic, which is great for people with sensitive skin, contact dermatitis, we also have these people that are telling us, you know, I, I haven't slept through the night in, you know, five years, 10 years. And I have a, I have a herniated C4, C5 that used to keep me up at night. It used to, used to interrupt my sleep cycle. And I can't tell you what that's like for anyone out there who hasn't experienced that, you know, a type of chronic pain that like prevents you from sleeping and that wakes you up at night. It'll make you crazy. It's, there's a reason yeah. why sleep, why sleep deprivation is um, a form of torture. And, you know, the fact that people are writing into us now, we have thousands of reviews and, and we have a, a plugin on our Slack channel that lets me read. I read every single review that we get. I've read thousands of reviews for our products. And when I see one that comes in about somebody who has fibromyalgia or eczema or, you know, something, something else that keeps them up at night and they say that they're finally sleeping on a regular sleep cycle, it's, I can't describe how happy that makes me. It's the best thing in the world. I Actually, last night I have some chronic pains in my neck and I couldn't sleep, so I understand where you're coming from. What do you have? I have no idea. Oh, no. My C1 and C2 are out of place. Um, oh, no. My hips are also out of alignment. There's a bunch of other stuff. But besides that, my mom is a dermatologist in Louisiana, so I, I will definitely make sure she listens to specifically this segment of this episode. So the, the other interesting thing about, about skin and, and sleep and, you know, why our sheets are so much better than cotton and but than polyester is the moisture management. And so because they are man-made, it's a man-made fabric, right? Like it's just doesn't grow on the ground as a fiber. The filaments of the, of the, of the fabric are actually almost perfectly round They're perfectly cylindrical. And whereas cotton, if you look under, an, um, under a microscope, it's natural. So it kind of like, it looks like this. And polyester is also. you were listening on a podcast, that was a, a circle with yeah. squiggles. <laughs> squiggle. Cotton's a squiggly circle. And then you pull up this lyle cell. It's a perfect circle. And so what ends up happening is if you sweat at night with our lyle cell, the sweat will evenly distribute across the entire, basically the entire fabric. So the entire bed sheet. It'll, it manages moisture incredibly, so it'll spread it across and evaporate it, and you'll never wake up in that pool of sweat that you'll often wake up in in the middle in a summer night, and so your sheets will stay fresher longer, 
it creates a hostile environment to bacteria growth. And in fact, if you introduce a population of dust mites into our Lyell cell, which I don't know why you would, but if you did, if you're doing a scientific study, uh, in about six weeks, that dust mite population will actually be cut in half, whereas with cotton, it will grow exponentially. And, wow. it's, be and it's because of the moisture management where our sheets stay cool and dry and other sheets will stay moist and not, not spread out and evaporate that moisture well. And so that's why if you ever go to the gym and you got a polyester towel or a cotton towel and you leave it in your trunk, <laughs> the next day it smells like death because of the bacteria growth. But you could, you, we, we're actually making Lyle cell towels now. We're about to come out with them uh, in the next few months. You can use a towel to wipe yourself off in the gym and you could throw it in your car. The next day it wouldn't smell at all because the moisture would have already left it. Wow. Yeah, that's, I'm really glad you know all this. Um, <laughs> I have to. Yeah, thank you for knowing so much about your product and your company. So, because you're not just giving like surface answers, you're like in there with the answers. I I had no experience with home textiles prior to founding this company, and now I am a weird expert in in Denver. Whenever Denver needs somebody in the home textile space, they always uh, wind up coming to Sheets and Giggles. It's kind of funny. Nice. Let me run through my questions real quick and see if we've covered. I think sure. we've covered most of the things that I wanted to ask you. So, oh, I want to talk about the water. Oh, okay. Is that about the water saving? Take it from here, maestro. So basically, so cotton is an extremely water thirsty crop. And additionally, on top of that, cotton also, if you walked into a textile mill and you saw them producing cotton, which you probably would if you walked into a textile mill, you'll see that about half of it will get thrown away. And it's because it's another, another reason why cotton is so unsustainable is because bugs love it. And so they use a lot of insecticides, a lot of pesticides. Cotton by itself uses about 16 to 24% of the world's insecticides as a crop. Yeah, just by itself. And it's nuts. And, and so when they get it into the factory, still about half of it ends up being too dirty to use and, and gets tossed. That's a huge water waste in terms of water needed to grow the crop. You need to use a lot of water when producing cotton to keep it at a certain temperature. Otherwise, the, the yarns will uh, fray and break as you, as you make it. And so there's a lot of water usage when it comes to cotton. And in fact, there's a great documentary on, on Netflix by Vox called Water Wars. And there's a documentary called Explained. And it's about how water is basically a finite resource. And it's not that when you use it, it goes away. It's that when you use it, it can't be used for other things at that point in time. And that's why you know states like California, when they go through a drought, it's so precarious because they just have a finite amount of water they can use at any, any given point in time. And so in that documentary, I remember I watched it probably three years ago or so when it came out. And that was the first time I ever really understood that how much water cotton was using. And basically for a, a single t-shirt, cotton t-shirt, which this is not cotton, this is, this is what I sell. But for a single cotton t-shirt, you know, you use about 2,500 liters of water for a single cotton t-shirt. And for a single cotton set of sheets, you're talking about about 4,000 liters of water for the average cotton set of sheets. And uh, just to give some context to that, I don't know if this is the actual number, but I do remember reading that's about three years worth of one person's water supply for one three, cotton t-shirt. Three, three to five, depending on if they're uh, man, woman, weight, how much they, but like, yeah, the, it's, it's about three to five years worth of the average person drinking water. And Which is insane. It's nuts. Yeah. And, and so we use far less than that to the tune of hundreds of liters versus, you know, versus thousands. And we estimated it's around about a 96% reduction, give or take. I mean, it's, you know, it's impossible to estimate. We don't know every manufacturer's pro, uh, processes, but we know it's a massive, you know, a, approximately a thousand gallon difference in the in the production processes and so we estimate that for every sheet set that we sell compared to cotton we save anywhere from three to five years of the average person's drinking water just by virtue of how little we use versus cotton and that winds up when we look at the numbers means that we've saved hundreds of thousands of years of drinking water compared to, in just our first couple of years of operation compared to cotton sheets and so 
I love that. That's one of my favorite things. There's a there's a energy reduction in the amount of kilowatt hours that we use versus cotton. We obviously we don't use any insecticides, no pesticides, which is you know a big hot button for me because of the ongoing insect extinction that we're experiencing in, in the world. And uh, yeah, overall, overall, I, you know, cotton's a great product, and I and I don't have any sort of I don't have anything incredibly negative to say about people who use cotton or or who would who would you know continue to use cotton. I just think that it's like a legacy product in the sense that it's something that we've always used. We, you know, we have tons and tons of uh, expertise in growing it, you know, turning it into fabric, how to care for it, how to manufacture it, where to sell it, how to market it is a big sticking point as to why we continue to use it. And so I just think that over time, I'd like to see the world transition to more sustainably produced textiles like Lyle Cell, um, or even a sustainably uh, manufactured viscose if, if you, know, you can figure out where it's being manufactured, if there's chemical runoff associated with the viscose process, you know, more hemp for clothing. And I, I, it's what I really look forward to seeing in the coming years. And I do my best to reduce the amount of cotton and polyester that I, that I purchase. Yeah, now that you have a, a manufacturer of the Lysol. Well, yeah, I got no, I got no excuse on the on the Lysol. I know, I know people that'll make me whatever I need. So. Exactly. <laughs> Just start a whole clothing brand. We're thinking about it. Shirt, shirts and giggles, or shorts and giggles. Uh, yeah, it, it it writes itself. Yeah, so. I mean, just like to put the thought process out there that like because you said, oh well, we're saving water. Um, we're saving this much water making eucalyptus sheets versus cotton sheets and for any sort of argument that might or like counterpoint that would get brought up well like oh well you don't have to make those sheets anyways and people could just reuse them and it then of course. my thought process is just like well people are going to buy things anyways so if they're going to buy things anyways probably before we actually like need to then like having the alternative of the eucalyptus sheet is actually then i would argue for yes you are actually saving water so well, yeah the, the most sustainable thing is to not buy anything right that's, but that's right. not the way it's gonna go no i mean I, you know there people in america throw away 10 million tons of uh textiles every year throw them away throw them in landfills the the number one most requested item in homeless shelters is socks the number two most requested item in homeless shelters is blankets and sheets. And so, you know, 38% of Americans buy new bed sheets every single year. And we tell people, and, and you know, a lot of that has to do with the fact that their homes have three or four bedrooms and they're rotating out a new set of sheets for maybe one or two of the bedrooms every, every year or two. But we always encourage people to donate their old sheets don't throw them away. We actually give people 10% off their order if they can prove to us that they donated the real old sheets. So I take a picture at a homeless shelter and email it to us. We'll give them a 10% off code for being a good person. And, you know, the, the bottom line is that, you know, people will, like you said, people can, Americans for better, for worse. And I think, un unfortunately, for a lot of it, for the worst, we're trained to consume. We are wonderful consumers. We, we you know, people walk down the aisle at Target and they have, no idea where the toothpaste is coming from, where the potato chips are coming from, where the, you know, the mouthwash or, you know, the clothing people don't know. And for the most part, they genuinely don't care. And it's, I just think it's something that we're trained to do since the time that we're little kids, right? They give you Mickey Mouse dollars to spend at Disney world and they give you play cashier sets to swipe fake credit cards and, and, you know, play cash register. And, I see it with my nephew, right? Like he's already being trained to trained to be a consumer. And, you know, we always tell people, if you don't need new sheets, don't buy them. Like don't buy anything. But if you need a new set or you're, you know, you're upgrading your mattress size to a different size or you're moving or, you know, it's been five, six, 10 years and you want to get a new set of sheets because these are your ones you have are worn out, then, you know, give us a try. Or it sounds like if you have the fibromyalgia, is that what you said? Or like yeah, well, chronic? well, so yeah, if you if you have a chronic nerve pain condition or something that's causing you to like be irritated by your sheets at night, I I would absolutely love more people to to give our sheets a shot because I think that it will change. It's already changed lives, and that's actually not something I anticipated when I started the company. I thought I was gonna 
have fun, do some good, contribute money to causes I care about, plant some trees. And the fact that people are telling me that we've changed their lives from, you know, the, the sleep that they get now is, is a very heartwarming and not something I anticipated. Yeah. That's like a nice cherry on top. Yeah. It's a perfect cherry on top. Well, Colin, thank you so much for answering all my questions. And if anyone has any questions, how could, how would you have them reach out to you best? I'm an easy guy to find. I am on, sorry, this is Harvey. He's just, oh. yeah. He's my guy. Hi, doggy. Yeah. He's just being uh, a little annoying, but I wanted to, I wanted to bring him into the interview instead of having him off to the side. So Harvey actually has his own webpage on our website. You can go to sheetsgiggles.com slash Harvey, and he's our VP of marketing. And I'm just going to pull my headphones out. And in terms of getting a hold of me, I'm really easy to find. Colin McIntosh, Sheets and Giggles, you know, LinkedIn. Don't email. I've got like 3,200 unread emails, so maybe, maybe don't email me. But LinkedIn messages, Twitter, I'm on Instagram. You know, I'm, I'm out there. But and Sheets and Giggles ourselves, we're on Amazon, sheetsgiggles.com is our website. And we're at sheetsgiggles everywhere. And we're a funny follow on social media, by the way. We don't just hawk our products constantly if anybody is looking for a fun account to follow that, you know, is a more uplifting account. Yeah, it's all about the memes, right? Memes and laughs. Yeah, we're, I mean, you know, it's betting, betting brands and other companies that just like continually post pictures of their bed sheets. And we're just, I'm like, okay, we get it. Like you sell sheets. Like, you know, like, so we try to avoid, avoid doing that. Well, cool. Yeah. I'll definitely have all those links and sites in the show notes. So thank you so much for being on my podcast today, Colin. It's a real honor to have you. No, I thanks so much for asking me to join. I, I think that was like the first word out of your mouth when you met me. So I'm glad we could make it, make it happen. Yeah. I think I asked you what you did and you're like, or maybe I said something I said I have a podcast and you said, Oh, what about sustainability and real estate? You're like, I have a sustainability sheet company. I was like, boom. Boom. It was yeah, match made in heaven. So I'm really glad I got to do this. Thanks for thanks for having me on and I hope it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'll catch you another day. Explorers of Modern Ways, thank you so much for tuning in today. You can find more of me on Instagram at Moving with Madison and YouTube Moving with Madison. YouTube is where I post the video recording of each episode, so you can watch along if you please. I hope you learned something new today, and that helps you take a tangible step towards creating your eco-friendly home.